We are at the dawn of this radical transformation of humans that by its very nature as a truly complex and emergent innovation, nobody on earth can predict. A poll of a thousand college students showed that almost 90% of them used the chatbot to help with homework. More and more vulnerable people are turning to AI chatbots for support. Entry-level jobs are vanishing at an alarming rate. Half of entry-level white-collar jobs disappearing and 10 to 20% unemployment in the next one to five years. First of all, they underestimate the magnitude of the AI revolution. AI is nothing like print. It's nothing like uh, the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. It's far, far bigger. It's the first technology in history that can make decisions by itself and that can create new ideas by itself. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. The idea that this AI disruption doesn't lead us to some very human catastrophe, I think, is overly optimistic. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. If that really happened, like if we really did just discover that there were a billion extra people on the planet who all had PhDs and were happy to work for almost for free, that would have a massive disruptive impact on society. What jobs are going to be made redundant in a world where I am sat here as a CEO yeah. with a thousand AI agents? Right. I was thinking of all the names of, my, of the people in my company yeah. who are currently doing those jobs. I was thinking about my CFO when he talked about processing business data, yeah. my graphic designers, my video editors, etc. So what, what jobs are going to be impacted? Yeah, all of those. You know, maybe this is useful for, for the audience. I think if your job is as routine as it comes, your job is gone in the next uh, couple of years. So meaning in those jobs, like for example, quality assurance jobs, data entry jobs, you're, you're sitting in front of a computer and you're supposed to click uh, and, and type things in a certain order. Operator and those technologies are coming on the market really quickly and those are gonna displace a lot of... Accountants. Accountants. Lawyers. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, I've just pulled a ligament in my, in my foot and they did an MRI scan and I had to wait a couple of days for someone to look at the MRI scan and tell me what it meant. Yeah. yeah. I'm guessing that, that's gone. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think the healthcare ecosystem is hard to predict because of regulation. And, and again, there, there's so many limiting factors on how this technology can permeate the economy because of regulations and, and people's willingness to, to take it. But, you know, things, unregulated jobs that are purely text in, text out. If your job, you know, you get a, you get a message and you produce some kind of artifact that's like probably text or images. That, that job is is at risk. People use this phrase, they say, AI won't take your job, a human using AI will take your job. Yes, I think that's true. But for many jobs, that'll mean you need far fewer people. My niece answers letters of complaint to a health service. It used to take her 25 minutes. She'd read the complaint and she'd think how to reply and she'd write a letter. And now she just scans it into um, a chatbot and it writes the letter. She just checks the letter. Occasionally she tells it to revise it in some ways. The whole process takes her five minutes. That means she can answer five times as many letters. And that means they need five times fewer of her. So she can do the job that five of her used to do. Now, that will mean they need less people. In other jobs, like in healthcare, they're much more elastic. So if you could make doctors five times as efficient, we could all have five times as much healthcare for the same price. And that would be great. There's, there's almost no limit to how much healthcare people can absorb. Mm. They always want more healthcare mm. if, it, if there's no cost to it. There are jobs where you can make a person with an AI assistant much more efficient and you won't lead to less people because you'll just have much more of that being done. But most jobs I think are not like that. So that's the question I often ask people. In the world with AGI, and I think almost immediately we'll get superintelligence as a side effect. So the question really is, in a world of superintelligence, which is defined as better than all humans in all domains, what can you contribute? And so you know better than anyone what it's like to be you. You know what ice cream tastes to you. Can you get paid for that knowledge? Is someone interested in that? 
maybe not, not a big market. There are jobs where you want a human. Maybe you're rich and you want a human accountant for whatever historic reasons. Old people like traditional ways of doing things. Warren Buffett would not switch to AI. He would use his human accountant. But it's a tiny subset of a market. Today we have products which are man-made in U.S. as opposed to mass-produced in China. And some people pay more to have those. But it's a small subset. It's a, almost a fetish. <laughs> There is no practical reason for it. And I think anything you can do on a computer could be automated using that technology. People in this country want to do certain types of jobs, not other types of jobs. And I'm not saying that that's good or bad, it's just the reality. So, you know, I, I, I joke like, like, you know, my kids are 15 and they don't want to work for 40 years in a uh, manufacturing job. And I don't want them to, because I don't want them to have the bad back that I have right now. Like, no, no, I mean, these, this is real. Like you work in one of these jobs for 40 years and you're messed up by the time you hit your age 60. So they don't want to do that. They don't want to work in a repetitive physical labor job for their life. And I hate to say like almost no young kids in this country do. So, they won't have to in 10 years with robots taking over all of that. They, they, they won't have to. And like the one knock that ro this whole robot revolution people have with it is it will displace human labor. So if you have this concept of a drop-in employee, you have free labor, physical and cognitive, trillions of dollars of it. It makes no sense to hire humans for most jobs. If I can just get, you know, a $20 subscription or a free model to do what an employee does, first, anything on a computer will be automated. And next, I think humanoid robots are maybe five years behind. So in five years, all the physical labor can also be automated. So one of the things that I study as well is besides AI and longevity, is the embodiment of AI, which is going to be in humanoid robots, autonomous cars, flying cars, and the like. You know, I've interviewed Elon, who I've known for 26 years, another company here in the U.S. called, uh, called Figure AI that Brett Adcock runs. And both of them have made the prediction that they expect by 2040 to have as many as 10 billion humanoid robots walking on the streets, right? Uh, and so I asked my friend, what's it, gonna, what's it gonna feel like when you're seeing a humanoid robot delivering your packages or walking down the street or coming over to ask you if there's something else you want done? He said, it's gonna feel normal. Uh, you know, in the beginning, it feels weird. Uh, it's a spectacle, we take photographs, but after a little bit, we fully adapt. And that's the brilliance of human mind and society. And it becomes normal. It's part of our lives. And I think it goes so far beyond human intelligence. It's my assumption that most of the work that we do is based on intelligence. So even like me doing this podcast now, hmm. this is me asking questions based yeah. on information that I've gathered, based on what I think I'm interested in, but also based on what I think the audience will be interested in. And if, oh. if an AI has... A, an IQ that is a hundred times mine and an in, a source of information that is a million times bigger than mine. There's no need for me to do this podcast. Hmm. I can get an AI to do it. And in fact, an AI can talk to an AI and deliver that information to a human. But then if we look at most industries, like being a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, accountancy, I mean, a, a lot of med the medical profession is based on information. Yeah. Um, driving. I think that's the biggest employer in the world is the profession of driving, whether it's delivery or Uber or whatever it is. Um, where, where do humans belong in this complex? Anything which is just information in, information out, is ripe for automation. These are the easiest jobs to automate. Um, like being a coder? A, like being a coder, or again, like being a, a, an accountant. A, at least certain types of accountants, lawyers, doctors, they are the easiest to automate. If a doctor, the only thing they do is just take information in, all kinds of results of blood tests and whatever. And they, information out, they, they, they diagnose the disease and they write a prescription. This will be easy to automate in the coming years and decades. But 
a lot of jobs, they require also social skills and motor skills. If your job requires a combination of skills from several different fields, it's, it's not impossible, but it's much more difficult to automate it. So if you think about a nurse that needs to replace a bandage to a crying child, this is much, much harder to automate than just a doctor that writes a prescription. Because this is not just data. The nurse needs uh, uh, good social skills to interact with the child and motor skills to just replace the bandage. So what are those skills? If I think it's all human skills. I think there human needs... Skills. So I think where the world is going to go, and at least this is where I'm taking a bet, is that as the end product becomes easier to produce, it's the humanity that's going to suffer. And unless we take personal accountability, both as individuals and organizations, to teach and learn human skills, they will disappear for all the reasons we're talking about. So how do I listen? How do I hold space? How do I resolve conflict peacefully? How do I give and how do I receive feedback? Those are all two different skills. And sure, you can have an AI friend. And that AI friend has been trained like the best, best psychologist to affirm you, the best listening skills that exist. Tell me about your day. Mm, that sounds difficult. Mm, boy, it's hard being you. Oh my God, it's so great being you. Have you, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's an affirmation machine built by a, for-profit company that wants you to stay on, mm -hmm. can't neglect that. But for the fact that nobody's learning how to be a friend, it'll feel good. You'll feel like you have a friend, but you're not learning to be a friend. They promised us social connection when social media came about. When we got Wi-Fi connections, the promise was that we would become more connected. But it's so clear that because we spend so long alone, isolated, having our needs met by Uber Eats drivers and social media and TikTok and the internet, that we're investing less in the very difficult thing of like going and making a friend and like going and finding a girlfriend. Young people are having sex less than ever before. Everything that is associated with the difficult job of making in real life connections seems to be um, falling away. I think the, the skill of being a storyteller and a communicator is critically important for any entrepreneur, right? At the end of the day, if you think about what an entrepreneur is doing, uh, part of what they're doing is creating a vision of the future that they think is possible, getting other people to believe in their future uh, and thereby join them as a co-founder or employee or join them as an investor or join them as a customer. And that's the process of communicating this product, this service, this future you want and getting people excited about it, wanting to join you. And being able to tell the difference between what is a fiction in our own mind and what is the reality, this is a, a crucial skill. And we are not getting better at finding this difference as time, go time goes on. And also with new technologies, which I write about a lot, like artificial intelligence, the fantasy that AI will answer our questions, will find the truth for us, will tell us the difference between fiction and reality, this is, this is just another fiction. I mean, AI can do many things better than humans, but for reasons that we can discuss, I don't think that it will necessarily be better than humans at finding the truth or uncovering reality. And it, the, what made you a great entrepreneur is not that the company exists, is that you built it with your hands and you've got the scars to show for it. Yeah. It was when things went wrong and you were forced to fix them and think that now when problems show up, you're quick, you're smarter. You're a much smarter businessman now than you were five years ago, six years ago. Yeah. Because you did it. And I think what we're forgetting is that there's something to be said for. And by the way, I'm a fan of AI. I want AI to make things. But I would hate to lose out on becoming a better version of me. So I think there's something to be said for writing your own symphony, painting your own painting, building your own business, you know, writing your own book. Not for them, not for the output, not for the output, for your personal growth.